once I was able to step away from that and start on a path of recovery, now granted, this is just my experience, that I noticed a lot of those things that my parents had told me early on, God is above you, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm a member of a program that does, uh, that is higher power based, I should say, God based. And there's so many similarities within that. And within that program as well, I'd also believe that there are applications worldwide, which is you cannot be a victim, right? You can't play the victim. If you're being a victim, you're being held down. And that's almost the most addictive drug on the planet, I believe, is playing a victim. In the conversation you're about to hear, Aaron Prager joined me to discuss the God-shaped hole. Aaron is the host of AP Unfiltered, a show focused on culture, society, and politics. He shares his experience of finding meaning, recovering from addiction, reconnecting with himself, and how this path offers lessons to those struggling in their own lives in the modern world. There's a lot of people who are pretty lost and a lot of people who are unhappy. People are having a difficult time finding meaning in their lives. And a lot of people are turning to things outside of themselves to kind of fill this void. And there's a lot of, you know, philosophers who have spoken about this uh, and, you know, just any kind of figures, like public figures talk about this, this kind of God-shaped hole. Mm -hmm. Um, And... This has been something that people have been commenting on, especially with the kind of loss of religion in society and the loss of God. And people tend to kind of turn towards the state to fill that void, or they turn to substances to fill that void, or they turn to like pursuing a life of hedonism and just like only live in the moment and nothing else matters. And I think that the result of that is we see a lot of unhappiness. So I wanted to kind of ask you, you know, throughout this podcast, your thoughts about all of that. And also, if you think that this is kind of a now problem, or is this just an existential human problem? And actually, maybe that's the first question. Do you think that this is something new or is this something old? So first off, I love the topic. Thank you for having me. Come on. I think in and of itself, this, what we're seeing in society now, the God-shaped hole, if you will, is a symptom of the problem right? It's manifesting itself as, as you said, hedonism. Uh, When you inevitably engage with a society that is ever increasingly becoming more godless, you're going to have a, you're going to have a society that feels less purpose driven. Like they don't have a purpose within themselves to begin with, which I think is ultimately one of the greatest ways for self-fulfillment is when you succeed at what your purpose is, if that makes sense. So, you know, parents being able to raise children, we talked a little bit about before about family, you can't take too much credit for what your kids do right, and you can't take too much credit for what they do wrong, because they are their own individuals. Same thing applies where you can derive purpose, though, from your children and raising them to be, whether it be God-fearing, whatever your values are dictating to you, I personally believe that a God-fearing household is one of the greatest forms of government that the world has ever seen. And Mm. I don't think it's, I don't think there is a... I don't think it's much of a stretch, if you will, to see that when you have increase in single parent households, you also have increase in all these sorts of different people self-reporting anxiety and all these different kinds of things because they are themselves struggling. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about this God-fearing household. What do you mean by that? So I was raised in a Jewish household, and I, I like to start there because it gave me whether I was paying attention or not. Cause you know, when you're a kid, you subconsciously take things in and whatnot, but I did act outwardly rebel against the faith. And I'm not claiming it's like, Oh, Judaism is the religion. It's not the religion. So on, whatever. But what I am making the claim is that whether or not my parents knew it, they were putting in values that I was able to understand subconsciously, some full consciously, that when I did reach teen years, I rebelled against the entire system, right? And my story, you know, I am a recovering alcoholic and drug addict. Uh, June 4th, 2016 is my sober date. So this summer will be eight years. And so I went down the path of hedonism. I went down the self-serving path, completely enveloped with selfishness, resentments flying everywhere. Mm. But Mm -hmm. what I do know is that once I was able to step away from that and start on a path of recovery, now granted, this is just my experience, that 
I noticed a lot of those things that my parents had told me early on, God is above you, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm a member of a program that does, uh, that is higher power based, I should say, God based. And there's mm-hmm. so many similarities within that. And within that program as well, I'd also believe that there are applications worldwide, which is you cannot be a victim, right? You can't play the victim. If you're being a victim, you're being held down. And that's almost the most addictive drug on the planet, I believe, is playing a victim. But to answer your question, to kind of come back to it, is the God-based home was able to be, my, through my parents teaching me about our specific religion, but those I believe have applications, Jewish teachings, Judeo-Christian values, I should say, have applications to everybody, mm-hmm. have benefited my life as an adult now more than anything. That makes a lot of sense. So, like you had that kind of baseline. And I know when I was growing up, it was kind of like that too. I mean, we were, uh, my dad is Catholic, my mom is Russian Orthodox. Hmm. Um, and so, but they were very secular, you know, like we didn't go to church or anything, but my father was an altar boy when he was young. So there was that kind of like that foundation of religion there. And my parents spoke to me about God. And we had these like private conversations. And so even though we weren't going to church and we weren't part of this kind of religious community, it was there as this kind of uh, value system that was like underlying everything. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is something that newer generations are losing more and more. It's like, you know, even if maybe that secularization is kind of the first step of that process of kind of like peeling away that foundation and it gets kind of diluted down through the generations. And then you kind of end up in a place where that's no longer a thing and you have everything is subjective and in a way it is, but you know, there's no kind of like morals that, that people are moored to that come from tradition. And I think that this is what we kind of see like when we see the woke stuff, for example, and like what you were saying there about victimhood and resentment, you know, that is like woke is all about that. You know, Marxism mm-hmm. was yeah. all about that. And you can see that as well in some people on like the new right. You know, it's not just a a political thing, but it's kind of a mindset of modernity in a big way. What do you think about that? Well, I, I, I agree with very much what you just said. I it makes me think of this Albert Einstein quote that I read the other day, and it was, if people are good only because they fear punishment and hope for reward, uh, then we're a sorry lot indeed. Essentially saying that I know, like how to tie this in with the, the God-sized hole in your soul is it creates a desire. So what are you going to fill that desire with? Is it going to be something materialistic or is it going to be something spiritual? And I always like to make the distinction between religiosity and spirituality because you know, I'm not here to preach any specific religion, even though I find that I find my solution spiritually or religiously through Judaism and Jewish paths. Um, but our but our but our modern society has done away with the desire for people, and I think that was I think that was figured out a long time ago. That 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 stone was pushed down the mountain that it was like, listen. If our goal, which I do believe the goal of the bigger the government, the smaller the citizen, or the phrase of the bigger the government, the smaller the citizen, and with big government comes corruption, comes power hungry people, just like in any socialist society, you know, Mm -hmm. name one socialist society that has worked. And through that, kicking out of God, edging God out, I like to say, of society was a necessity for people to create the new world that they wanted to in fact, rule over. That makes so much sense. And, you know, like you saw that with the Soviet Union, you know, you saw that where you had to push out religion, like some of the first people that they went after were leaders of the church. Like there was no place to have, um, you know, you couldn't have idolatry of the state at the same time as idolizing God. Exactly. So it, it it's like it, it creates this kind of, um, personal relationship with like, you know, uh, um, with God and for people who maybe it's not God, but they still have something that is very similar. Some people call it the universe, you know, for anybody who's atheist, they have certain principles, you know, in substitute of God. And maybe we can talk a little bit about that later if you think that there's a, a big difference there. But without that, 
it's like you have that void. And that's where the state comes in. And I, I know that Carl Jung, he spoke about this a lot um, in one of his last books, The Undiscovered Self. He talks about this and it's post-World War II. And he says, this is what happens. You know, you have all of these people who who don't individuate. They don't, you know, become themselves and they don't believe in God. They don't really believe in anything. So what's going to happen there is that they're going to be herded into idolatry of the state. Well, I, I firmly believe that you you can turn anything into a god. The left, the woke ideology, woke is a religion in and of itself. Yeah. Like, pe- people follow what Ibram X. Kendi says the same way that, you, just to use your example, the Russian Orthodox follow what the church has to say. It's, it's mm-hmm. the exact same thing with almost even more ferocity, if you will. People are willing to die on the hill of it's good to give double mastectomies to 12-year-old girls. They're willing to die on that hill is their point. And, and, and you only see that type of ferocious defense of a belief with someone who actually is fearing of something bigger than themselves. So woke ideology mm. is a religion. What do you think that they're actually fearing? In terms of? Like if you're so if they're fearing something bigger than themselves, let's say like the woke. Like, I mean, there's and, and you're right. I think there's there's different idols. There's like Greta Thunberg. George Floyd. And you can see it. You could see it in the way that they there's all of this these paintings that are that are made, you know, in the images of these people. So what do you think it is that that the woke actually fear? That's so I think it's too, them. I mean, I, I I think it could be, you know, I think out of the three things I'm about to suggest, like the Greta Thunbergs and the the, the actual figureheads themselves are on the on the are the least, but top but top above everything else. Now you have to separate the leaders and the followers. So the people who are just in the streets doing their thing, not the leaders, they're people who are so barren of a sense of self-identity and connection to something that they are filling that void with activism. That is what they are. They feel like they're a part of something now. Like why do young teens join gangs? They want to be part of something, whether it's for protection, mm-hmm. whether it's for self-identity, so have you. And then, like I said, I think the, like the Thunbergs, those things, it's the least. But then the second category is people who are running the show here. They are the embodiment of every spiritual malady that you could think of, in my opinion. Like, look at the, the head of BLM. Like, she took those funds, which she was that she was supposed to be, do, you know, doing whatever they do with and helping the cause, quote unquote. She buys mansions for her family. She buys mansions. So it's it's not a stretch to say that people who are always looking for something will either, like if you're looking for something, you can, you have, you're at a fork in the road. Either you're going to go the way of self-serving or you're going to go the way of enlightenment and the way of like, I always say accountability is not a bad thing. The, the Marxist left has now told people that accountability to anything but the state is bad. Yes, yes. And, and you know, that kind of really ties in with what you're talking about before about victimhood, like feeling like a victim, having all these grievances, having all these resentments, like that kind of mindset means you're never accountable because you're always thinking that everybody else is the problem and that you mm. are a victim of your yes. circumstances. <laughs> so like, how can you be accountable, you know? And, and this is something that I think is also kind of like a little bit of a juvenile mindset. And in a way, that's probably why there's so many young activists, because that's, you know, when you haven't completely matured in your worldview, like that's kind of how you can see things. Like you can be pulled into that. You know, it's like you haven't developed the emotional or spiritual intelligence necessarily to be able to kind of sort through all of that stuff. It's like you see everything that happens to you as being something that you had no control over. So like with time and with maturity, if you're if you're given those kind of values, you know, and if you have, I think, some of those traditions, then you can be, you know, you can be moved into that direction. But if not, then it's kind of just just chaos in a way. So, yeah, yeah, I, I, I'd say that this kind of also goes back to your, your when you asked me the question that you had about about family having God centered house. I mean. So when I when I propose the, the 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 thesis the idea that if you don't have a 
if, that if you don't have God in your life or a version of something that is equivalent to God, which I don't believe there is an equivalent, but for argument's sake, let's go with that. You fill it with other things that give you purpose because people inherently want to find purpose. But so I always get asked the question, well, then, yeah, people find purpose within activism. They find purpose within these things. So how does your argument apply? And I say, well, there's a precursor to all of this. Th that is a statement based on the underlying agreement that the people we're talking about have not come out of, let's say, a two-parent household who are teaching them that the, the ch the, teaching the child that they are not the alpha and the omega of the universe, that they are accountable to other things and instilled a sense of values within them that then they could bring to the world. Chances are they're not going to go down the path of activism. Hmm. Well, I, you know, I think that that can be true a lot. I, I'm sure that it is statistically, but I think that there's, there might be more to it than that. And, and I think, you know, like I'm thinking about your personal story. I'm thinking about my own personal story, like things I haven't talked about publicly, but you know, even people who grow up in, in good enough households, you know, they can really struggle with these things mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. and, and have periods in their life where, you know, they get kind of pulled into chaos and they get unmoored from those values. And in a way, it's it's interesting when I you did said myself. at the beginning. Yeah. yeah and, and and I've done that too. And so I can totally relate. And and so it's like rebelling against what you know to be good values in a way, like rebelling from all of that. It's it's like I think there's like a natural inclination to rebel when you're young. And I think that it's healthy, but taken to the extreme, it just, I think, becomes self-destructive. Yeah. It's the, it's the, it's, it's, I'll speak for myself. And then I, I believe there's parallels. Yes. For clarification, I came from a two parent household. Yes. My parents divorced when I was 13. It was very tough, but I don't use that as an excuse for anything. I came from a two parent household, had opportunities, decided to go the route of drugs and alcohol, Edge got out of my life. I was at Bernie Sanders rallies for clarification in 2015. You know, uh, looking back at that, yeah, it was a part of my story. It's very interesting. It taught me some things actually. But at the end of the day, I found my way back to it. And yes, just because someone doesn't necessarily come from a two parent household does not mean they're going to turn into some lunatic. The goal is in order to what is going to define your moral character going forward. Is you, you say, what what moors you to what moors you down? For me, I have to have I have to have an understanding that my basic instinct is to rebel against authority. That's what religion <laughs> is authoritative. The parental household is authoritative. Um, <laughs> that's my go to. That's my modus operandi, if you will, my mode of operation. Yeah, I get and that <laughs> exactly. So it, so but but it but it's also like when I decided to stop. When I found when I decided enough was enough, hit my rock bottom, if you will, and I did start to take active steps towards finding in, entrenching my life more spiritually, not religiously at this point in my life, things started to change for the better, and my eyes started to wake up to a lot of the self-serving behaviors I was engaged in. And I only I'm only using my story as a reference point because I do feel like it has parallels to what we're talking about. And it, you can see a broad application of a lot of people probably having the exact same story. Yeah, you know, Andrew Clavin usually says we learn Love by him. stories. Yeah, it's I, I do too. And I've been listening to his stuff for many years. And I think that that's so true. Like we do learn from stories. And, you know, we can talk about all of these concepts, but people relate to things that they, you know, they know something about. They listen to your story and they're like, I find myself in that too. Like in, in the human experience, there's universal experience. So we don't have all of the same details. But we we go through some of the same things quite often. And so, you know, I, I could totally see in your story when I learned it, you know, I could see pieces of myself and parts of myself and reflections of what I had experienced in my own life, you know. And I, I also rebelled against authority. And, you know, now my life is is totally different. I'm I'm more, um, how can I say? Uh, I, I'm not just rebelling for the sake of rebellion, but I still have a healthy skepticism. So you can kind of like yeah. find a middle ground with all of that. So I think that it's it's a good trait to have. But again, why do you think that like, I mean, for you, you can talk about yourself if you'd like, or you could talk about in general. Um, what do you think is that kind of 
the like seeking this kind of hedonistic path of like self destruction. What do you think like br- brought you towards that or brings people towards that? Well, I, I think it's the human condition. I just think that's I, I I when 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 people a question I get asked a lot is, Aaron, do you think people are inherently good or bad? Hmm. And I, I I say, I don't think people are inherently bad. They're definitely not inherently good, though. They're inherently hmm. self serving. Look at look at our you know Neanderthals. Look at cavemen. Look at look at everything throughout you know history. Like at every chance in history, people will take advantage of situations with nefarious intentions. That's the hmm. way we operate. I don't. I don't necessarily think that it's some new phenomena. I think it's been exacerbated by the way that the modern leftist ideology across the world has 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 broadened out. Because now you have mainstream media, you have every channel that you could think of of information propagating the ideas that if you believe in God, you're stupid. If you're, if you, you don't need to do service work. Like you just need to just do yourself. You you can, you can wait till you're 50 to have kids, which biologically, I mean, it's interesting yep. take, yep. but you can do all these things and it, it, it just hurts people. You said something earlier I wanted to touch on real quick. And you, it was about, about, about stories when people talk with one another. Another thing I believe that the left has destroyed is community. It's community. Pete no, not Nearly as many people go to church, which was the best form of community that the world had ever really seen. People got together. They were of service. They swapped ideas, exchanged ideas. People got people, you know, you know, very old times, you know, would have their children meet there and they eventually would grow up and get married. Like Hmm. church, people who go to church now are demonized. You know, I'm not even Christian, but I can acknowledge that fact. Um, And the and the the family, like when two families like my friends, we don't have kids yet, but my friends have kids. We still get together every every Saturday, like our Shabbat. Like I don't use my phone, but I only use my phone and my car in order to transport me to go and hang out with our group of friends that we see every single Saturday. That is something that is so powerful. And I really don't because they're not only are we engaging spiritually, but we're also engaging on a level that we swap ideas and that I, we have a free flow of information that that is under attack right now. So in a way, it's almost a rebellion to to, to be able to like, it, people might think of, I'm stupid for saying that, but it's no, true. No, no, I see it. It's like getting together with people. You know, I was just talking about this with my husband last night and I was, I saw my parents over the weekend and I was like, times were really different when you guys were growing up in a way. Like I remember, you know, when we were kids, we would get together exactly like you're saying with all of the families that were friends, all of their kids, we would do all of our New Year's Eve celebrations together. We would have like basketball leagues where we would get together on the weekend and like rent out a gym and and play these games just among friends. We would have friends of our family come up to our cottage every summer and spend, you know, weekends or weeks with us. And like that was, you know, that kind of community and that social life, all of that was just ingrained into life. And, it, and you know, as an adult, I look back and think like, those are the memories that I can look fondly upon now. But we've become pretty atomized, you know, since then. And, and starting in 2020, it really exacerbated that pre-existing trend. And it's like now people have kind of you know, if you do something for like three weeks, what is it? You you start a habit, something like that, so, like a short a time frame, yeah. right? So 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 now it's like people have also got into this habit where like they don't really go out and see people anymore. They just kind of you know stay to themselves, um, and they're just it's like almost like waiting for for permission to live life, like waiting for something to happen, just like going about your thing, doing your job, doing whatever it is you do when you get home in the evening. For some people, it's just Netflix and chill (laughs) and that's it, (laughs) you know? So, so is that like part of the kind of, um, the manifestation, like you were saying, it's like the, the God shaped hole is like a symptom. Like, do you think that that's part of it too? Well, yes, I, I 100% think that there's, there's a component there. I mean, what what the governments did around the world during the pandemic was atrocious and abhorrent. Don't come even don't even come close to it. They sabotaged humanity. Now I'm not and I and I choose my words very specifically there. Mm-hmm. To to how it how I'm referencing this to our discussion now is they implanted. Think about this: before COVID, 
you at least had to maybe call a pizza shop, talk to a human being to get a pizza. Now it's, you place the order on your phone, you, ha- you select leave at door, so you never yeah. have to interact with them. And people yeah. are super, super, super content now because it's, because we had to, be, depending on what your you know, political ideology, I guess, or your moral ideology is, you had anywhere from a year to three years of no human interaction. And that, to your point, it starts a behavior. That starts a behavior, and now people think of it as normal, where if you just slammed someone against that, they rebelled against it. And you did see a whole bunch of people rebel against it, people who, once again, were already pre-ingrained with certain ideas and moral and moral fiber that mm-hmm. prevented them from being lured into that. Yes, yes, I agree. And and I was definitely one of those people. This is where the rebellion, you know, came in and, and it was actually a good thing. It was an asset and having those those principles, as you're saying. And I remember, too, you know, I was pregnant at that time, you know, during this whole thing. And and it was it was a scary time to be pregnant because there was a lot of institutional abuse and things like that. And um, and it was just you were made to think like you can't go out and do anything, but I continued to do my life and and conduct my life as I did before. But, you know, it was other people were afraid in a lot of ways. And so like, you know, you, you do what you can. But one of the things that that really got to me is, and I just thought about this the other day, I was remembering that time because it's like traumatic in a way. And I think about it and I was so afraid, like my son would be born and he wouldn't get to see human faces, you know, and, and I got mm. into a, a huge battle with like I was, you know, supposed to give birth in the hospital and I ended up not doing that and giving birth at home, which was amazing. And um, just basically they were like, yeah, you've got to wear a mask like your husband's got to wear a mask. Like I was like, you know, my baby's going to come into the world and not see his parents faces mm. and how how much more dehumanized can you get? And that's like many people experience that, like many people who gave birth during that time, children who were born, they were born into like the machine, you know, they were like born into this kind of like, you know, um, the matrix the, into the matrix. Yeah. And, and so I'm kind of worried about like how that's going to play out over time, you know, like what do you think are going to be the future implications of, of those kinds of these kinds of policies and this conditioning, like as it as it pans out over time. Well, I, I I think just like with anything, as long as it's allowed, people people have this fallacy in their head that they cannot affect anything themselves. It's it's a it's untrue. You can. I know in my specific area, we went out all the time with no masks. We went out all the time and tried to live our lives, went to the stores we could. We walked into the stores with no mask. We were asked to put masks on. We said no. Mm-hmm. We just said respectfully, we're not going to do that. You can kick us out if you'd like. We hope you don't. And we were kicked out on some occasions. But everybody has their own agency to do stuff. Now, just like each person chooses to go and follow leftist ideology and become part of the, another cog in that machine and be bootlickers for the establishment that they're, try, that they're, that they're so happy to, to fall in line with, Everybody else has the agency to one act at a time, not do it, be respectful. You know, I'm not advocating any sort of, you know, rah, rah. Mm -hmm. You have the ability to do that. I think that's how you break the cycle is just more people have to realize that it's like a snowball effect. It's like pay it forward. You know, one act of kindness can can turn into a snowball effect. One act of defiance, one peaceful act of defiance can turn into a snowball. And You know, that's why I think, you know, here in the States, at least I think a a libertarian candidate will never win because people feel like one, their vote doesn't matter if they throw it away on a third part. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, And I think like, you know, as we were talking about before, I'm in Canada, you're in the States and there are distinct differences. You know, Um, I don't know if you know this, but I found this out from a friend. Uh, I would have to really check it out for accuracy. But apparently the the motto for Canada during Canada's founding was peace, order and good governance. So that's very different from, you know, life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness or, you know, even the pursuit of private property in, in some texts, if you go back. And so like we really saw that there was it was there were not many people who exercised agency. It's like within the tradition of being Canadian to have peace, order, and good governance, to follow the rules, to really, you know, not exercise your agency and to act as a collective, 
you know. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when the times are difficult, you act as a collective for the greater good. And I think that what's cool about the states is that there are people who really do believe, you know, in the ideas of the founding of America, which are really about that kind of the individual you know, and the rights of the individual being at the forefront. And it doesn't mean you don't have community. It doesn't mean, you know, Mm -hmm. a lot of people, they mistake all of that. Can you talk a little bit just about that, that kind of philosophy of, you know, individualism kind of versus collectivism that's, that's really um, kind of inherent in, in the, in the founding of the U.S.? So uh, it, it immediately makes me think of the fact that collectivism immediately leads to tribalism. And that's what you see. You see this fracturing on a a level that people call political. I call it moral because you can't distinguish – you can't call some of the atrocities that are being proposed by certain political parties as politics anymore. That's a moral corruption in my opinion. But yes, America was founded on the fact that we're not going to bend the knee to something arbitrarily. You know, we're not going to just sit idly by and let you trample all over us. We have a vision that we believe is going to be good. And by no means is every aspect of it good whatsoever. I mean, think about it. There was the three different main ways of governance, and we decided to do all three. We're like, we're going to have a monarch, which is, okay, president. We're going to have parliament, which is like the uh, you know the Congress. And then we're, so we have checks and balances throughout everything. Like we were like, okay, one is going to be bad. Two's not good either. Three's not good either. And then for somebody, I forget who comes along and says, hey, let's just do all three of it. So it was the great experiment. Hmm. And people now are seeming to embrace revisionist history of, oh, the Soviet Union was great. And the only thing bad about it was just there was a, there was a, there was a famine for a little bit, you know, discounting all the millions of deaths that took place, you know, and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't. Some parts of Canada, I'm not too impressed with my Canada history. Somebody told this to me. Wasn't parts of, we wanted to have Canada, parts of Canada join us, but Canada was like, no, 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 we're good. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. It was the loyalists, you know, they wanted to remain loyal to the crown. So, like, there's the really like. So, the motto makes sense that you were saying with governance. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, yes. And so, there's really like that distinction was there from the beginning. And I, I think that you can see how it plays out when you compare these two countries, you know, that are like just beside each other that have like, you know, the kind of equal opportunity, all things being given climate wise and everything else. I mean, it gets a little colder in some areas of Canada, but oh, yeah. um, I, I think it's really the ideas that were very different from the get go. And, and so this is why for me, like to see kind of Canada follow this really collectivist path now, and, and we're pretty much like, a, a mixed economy at best, a socialist country, I would say, like, and, and in some areas, fascist. There's a lot of, of merger between corporation um, and, and big corporation and, and government. Um, you know, we have public health care, which is a, a terrible system. Now it's becoming death care. You know, like people, mm. like the government's producing white papers saying, like, this is how much money we can save. If people go get euthanized, they're opening up all of these laws. They're basically like, I mean, we're we're in a very, very bad place, um, but it doesn't surprise me so much. But what does concern me about seeing America in some pockets replicate these same kind of ideas and these tendencies is that like, you know, America is like exceptional in the world in the way that it was formed and in the way that people still believe in those ideas. And it's like the last bastion of freedom and maybe like the only like pure, as close as you can get to a pure bastion of freedom. And so like it, if if the world loses America as a free country, then like I don't see there being much hope for the rest it's a scary proposition. I'm, and you know, I'm not going to sit here and, you know, list off all the things that I think, you know, why America is the greatest country on earth. Um, in some aspects, I'll be completely honest. I don't, in some aspects, I don't believe we're the greatest country on earth anymore. I don't. We've just look at the landscape of what has happened, what has taken hold, Mm -hmm. um, what's been allowed to percolate, um, with, with how corrupt our, our governments have got, how our elected bureaucrats, or, or sorry, our unelected bureaucrats are just allowed mm-hmm. to maintain power and in some instances have more power than the elected officials. Yep. That is not what our founding fathers here in the States had in mind. 
That was the opposite of what that's called tyrannical top down control that needs to be gutted and shivved. Yeah. You, said, you, you, you mentioned death care. I literally just filmed a video the, yesterday, comes out next week, on maids or maid, uh, medically assisted, uh, medical assistance in death. And that is probably the most evil thing that I've heard in recent history, um, especially when it comes to the fact that they're now, correct me if I'm wrong, talking about potentially for mental disorders. Yes, for mental health. For mental illness. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I have a question for you, and I'll, I'll I ask this in the video, but I'll ask you in your audience. What? Ask yourself, what level of of wanting to end your existence doesn't have a component of depression? So if they throw depression in there, that sets for sets for a pretty evil outcome. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I I I think it's a really good question, and you know they're also applying this now to minors. They wanted to do this for minors uh, before uh, the COVID era. And then what happened was when everybody was busy looking over here and, you know, lockdowns and restrictions and mandates and all of this stuff, they started changing the laws and passing things, you know, um, in the parliament that basically changed it so that you no longer have the safeguards you have before. Like you can have literally the person who administers the maid can be your witness and that's it. Can that's you imagine the situation? Like Nurse Ratchet can, can sign off on your maid. And you can go in the same day. There's no waiting period anymore. You can literally like call a, a telephone line and be like, hey, I'm coming over. Like it's, it is evil, I think. And, um, and, you know, I think that again, just to like kind of come back to like our mm. core topic of the God-shaped hole, like there's something in there that, you know, to me, I think has to do with the loss of God in society. And I'm sure you have thoughts about it. What do you think? Well, I mean, the, the loss the loss of God in society, it, 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 it's, it directly leads to these things. I mean, if you believe, like, Judeo-Christian values, which I do believe has been one of the most powerful forces for good on the planet ever in history, mm -hmm. praises life, condemns death. So at every turn, you are seeing one side of the, one side of the spectrum holding that up and one side doing the converse of that. I mean, uh, and I and I hate I hate a strong word. I strongly dislike the fact that a lot of our you know political heads, supposed to be our leaders, hide behind their say that, that Joe Biden says he's you know, devout Catholic. Like, then why are you signing all this legislation that flies directly in the face of everything the Catholics stand for? You know, and yeah. I'm sure Tr I'm sure Tr uh, Trudeau's got a bit of that. Oh, I don't know. I don't think that like he considers himself. Um... Any kind of, you know, religious man. Um, he, well, I think well, like fo not following his not following his moral <laughs> doctrine, I guess, or unless it's corrupt in, in general. So, Yeah, yeah. No, um, I don't I don't think he is, you know, and that's actually another distinction, too, with Canada and the United States is that like there is more organized religion in the U.S. than in Canada now. Like there's mm. not that much, you know, there's not that much um organized religion and especially as an influence like in politics you know like a lot of the times you'll see that people who are more conservative tend to be believers like whether they're following judaism or catholicism or protestantism whatever it is like there you know that seems to be a kind of element of people who vote for certain political parties but in canada it's almost like everybody is like it's it's mm. it's kind of like disconnected from politics, but I don't think that there are very, very many people who practice um, any kind of organized religion. Mm. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Do you, do you think that there's also like a danger in having kind of like organized religion um, become a part of a political identity? Like I know that, you know, the church and state are separate, but do you think that there's kind of some danger there that you see in your country? So, you, you brought up, let's say, let's so like Republican lawmakers, let's say Republicans in Congress, they will be like, oh, God, this, God, that. They will mention God during their speeches, let's say. That to me signifies that their rationale is coming from a value that they themselves hold, right? America was founded on Judeo-Christian values. Something a lot of people don't know is the original seal for the United States, as proposed by Thomas Jefferson, was actually Moses leading the Jews across the Red Sea. That was the initial seal proposed by Thomas Jefferson. 
Yes, wow. there's a there is inherent danger to answer your question in people only using God as a rationale to pass laws. There are laws and there are religion, but to invoke God as part of a rationale, as long as it's value based and follows the law to the T, I don't see an issue. Okay. It's when it becomes too powerful. Yes. Okay. I could see that. So using that as a rationale to impose your own subjective morality onto somebody else through the law that, that goes against. So, so I'll give you an example. Most Republicans are, are pro-life. They're anti-abortion. I, I, I wouldn't, and then most people I know don't want who are, who are pro-life do not want it to be, uh, made illegal here in the States because the Bible says so they want, they want to make it illegal because of all the dangers and all the science actually that backs up what their, their rationale. So that's the distinction that I make. Okay. Okay. I could see that for sure. But to push back on that too, you know, because like, I think that, you know, there's, if you would come from, let's say a libertarian perspective, you would say, mm -hmm. okay, like I might not like it myself. Um, but who am I to decide what somebody else does? Like, and, ab and abortion is really, really tricky. I mean, this is probably one of the trickiest things. And I have my own personal opinions about it, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I feel like I opened up a can of worms here. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. But, but, but I, think that it's, I think it's interesting to talk about these things. And mm -hmm. there are things that are sticky and that people don't always want to talk about. Um, s because I think that, like, this kind of comes to the core again of, like, a belief in in God or a higher power and like to what degree should you be able to play God and make those kind of decisions and and it's it's directly related to the made question right like should you be able to play God and so when you have this kind of society that is decoupled from God then like these become questions like you could say like you could have eugenics you could have euthanasia like, oh, you know what I mean? Like it becomes mainstream in a way like these things are are no longer taboo. Like we know that across civilizations past, they had abortions and they had, you know, people would euthanize themselves if they were very, very ill or for whatever reasons, you know, like these are these are the kind of things that people will do. But I think that the danger um, is when this becomes just like something that's just like normalized by the state. You know, the state's like, oh, yeah, this is all good stuff, you know, um, then then I think that that kind of reflects that kind of uh, the loss, the loss of of God in society. Well, yeah, I, I for for in full disclosure, I have a I, I have two sides that live inside of me. I have the tra traditional conservative and I have the libertarian side. So I could sit in front of somebody and say, hey, listen, like this is my view on this. But I but ultimately, I believe this should be the path that we choose to go ahead with this. Mm -hmm. When it comes to civilizations in the past, like, yes, there's a reason why, you know, time is linear, right? We, we, we learn from the mistakes of our past where societies were doing all of these barbaric things. We evolved past it. And now we seem to be regressing back into these almost medieval way of thinking that is not of benefit to us any longer. Well, you know, that's really funny, Aaron, because you talked about tribalism, like collectivism leads to tribalism. And I think that this is really important because, you know, tribal societies were what we had kind of like pre-civilization. And so that's kind of exactly what you're saying here. It's like going backwards. Like when society becomes more tribal, it's, I think, because they don't have, you know, either it's God or it's certain principles. But like, I think you can make the argument that it's been linked to the Judeo-Christian tradition of having, you know, that belief in God and all of the commandments and the beliefs that come with that, that keep people away from tribalism, because it's like, it's a code that you follow. You know, it's like tribal behavior is like, it's, it's kind of natural in a way, like people are going to scapegoat each other, people are going to attack each other, people are going to, like, move towards the people that they agree with the most, and they're going to side with the persecutor, or they're going to side with the, um, the bad guy in a way, the one who's doing harm, like that's kind of like tribal behavior. And like, that's what we see on, on the left, you know, they, mm -hmm. that's the kind of behavior that it is, you know, it's like that reversal of victim and offender. And so I think that that's like, you know, pretty essential when thinking about like the loss of God in society is like, you're going to have a more tribal society when you don't have that.
Absolutely. I think you hit the nail on the head. God was the great bridger of cultures, right? Because people, if you believe in the same thing, it doesn't matter what culture you come from, if you could have a common reference point in something. And God used to be that great mediator where people would come together and whether it was through one religion or was rather through another religion, you know, you would have Christians in Africa, you'd have Christians in Europe, you'd have Christians in the United States, in South America, Russia, and that, you know, Jews with the diaspora, they all went somehow and somehow all came back to Israel somehow, you know, and on the left, on the converse of that, you see climate, uh, LGBTQIA issues become that reference point that, all these different cultures now are kind of coming together within the States under that banner. And that is their God. That is their source of desire for purpose and what they're ultimately chasing because it does give them that sense of civilization, if you will. And then the enemy to them are the people who say, no, that's wrong. We need to go back to what, what had advanced us to this part in our human history that has yielded so many bountiful resources and, 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 uh, and, and, and things for people that we now take for granted. So for anybody who's listening to this show um, and like maybe doesn't believe in God or maybe is agnostic, you know, like I think like the whole message here for me anyways is like to talk about these things without saying like, hey, you know, this is something that might be right or wrong for your life. But like, what was it like for you personally when you you went through that kind of rebellion and you moved away from God, you were edging out God? What did that look for like for you in your life? So I started using drugs and alcohol when I was about 12 and progressed into me being a full-fledged methamphetamine user, uh, alcoholic, physically addicted to alcohol, and that became my God immediately. And hmm. you made a good point. I do want to emphasize to viewers, for the point of this, does take God and simplify it out to good orderly direction. You know, something like that, something that can that is not yourself and not another human being that can give you direction. Yeah. When I, I like got that. when I got sober, I did not get sober with like I'm going to find God now. I'm going to become mm. religious like, you know, as of now, I don't wear a yarmulke. I'm heavily tattooed. Uh, you know, I have a piercing. I'm not your your stereotypical, you know, Brooklynite Chabad Jew. Um but that wasn't my goal was to come back to Judaism. I just wanted to live a better life because I was sick of feeling the way that I felt. And I had run out of people to blame for my problems, ultimately. That was my rock bottom moment, was I ran out of people to blame for my problems. So, but, th but a funny thing happened is through, the, prog through the, the program that I had been involved with, and for your listeners once again, everybody runs their life on a program whether you know it or not. Hmm. So it's just a matter about picking one that works for you. Mine wasn't working for me. The one I ended up choosing to try out to help me benefit my life wasn't religious. But through doing the steps in order to benefit my life, I, I started coincidentally to start coming back to the things that my parents told me when I was a kid in my house about values, about Judaism, the, le the life lessons, the stories, the metaphors, the analogies that, are in, that were in the Torah, hmm. that I was able to be like, wait a second, this clicks here, this clicks here, this clicks here. And everybody's experience is different. Like I said at the beginning, I'm not here to preach Judaism, but yeah. for me- a funny thing happened. The only two rules in a spiritual journey or trying to better your life to level up, if you will, is beginning and continuing. That's it. It's a practice. Yes. It is a practice. So, so like, was that for you? Was it very just, was it very kind of like personal? I mean, did you have moments? Like, I know in the last few years, like, I, I kind of was, you know, agnostic, I guess, in the past few years before, like, 2020 and then my husband and I before our son was born like had totally life-changing events you know because of the external factors that we couldn't control you know um from the top down <laughs> and you know so so you know like my husband was was flying airplanes for 18 years like you know we had this you know just bought a house we were living in the country we were going to start a family like life was great um and then suddenly like this happened and we struggled so much. We were like, how are we going to do this? Like, how are we going to, like, we were sinking. We were sinking in a ship that had, like, holes coming out. You know, there was water coming out everywhere. <laughs> and um, 
it's really crazy, actually. You'll probably appreciate the story. And and um, it's, it's really personal, but I think it's important. Uh, so we were like, we need to, we need to make some money any way that we can. Like we've got to go in every single corner and like, you know, and do something. So we were like planting garlic because we were like, okay, we can turn over this garlic and sell it at farmer's markets and we can do all this stuff with our land. And we were like looking for every little pocket of things that we could do. And so there was, um, we had on our property, these giant mushrooms, they're called puffball mushrooms. Have you ever seen them? Uh, I can't say that I have. I'll probably not. They're they're yeah. probably like you know in Canada only. Like <laughs> so, <laughs> the Canadian they, mushrooms, yeah. Yeah, they they grow in these in these forested areas. They're these massive mushrooms, and people like to consume them. They'll make like pizza crusts out of them. They'll eat them like in whatever. I, I would never eat one of those things, but I was like, I'm gonna sell all of the mushrooms that I can find on this property. And so I went about gathering the mushrooms. I was pregnant. It was like you know and and. And I don't know, something was kind of changing within me because I was, you know, creating life at the same time. And I felt that like everything would be okay somehow. Mm. And so I picked up all of these mushrooms, you know, put them on the back of our pickup truck in a bunch of containers and I was selling them. I had like some people come over and say, we're going to pick up your mushrooms. And there were two pastors who came to our house, drove down the long driveway and they they were just you know uh, coming for a mushroom and when they got there you know we talked a little bit and i told them a little bit about our struggles and they said can we can we do a prayer for you and i was like okay sure you can and they prayed like it, this rapturous prayer and it was <laughs> like it was very spiritual for me and it i was just really touched by it and they said, you know, like, we bless you and your husband. We hope that you'll find a, another income source, that you'll be able to keep this house over your head, protect you, your unborn child, everything, you know? And it was just like, it was a complete prayer. They said, if you ever want to call upon this prayer again, just ask ask for it and it, and it will be put out there again to God. And after that, you know, like a week later, we were recruited to to do, you know, a job and we were like going to survive. And basically it just like something happened in me that I was like, I felt like, you know, we were on the right path and we were, we were speaking out, you know, and, and using kind of our, our talents to create videos and do things and talk about, you know, all of these assaults on civil liberties and everything that we were seeing. And we were standing for something we believed in. And I thought we were on the right path. And I kind of felt like God saw us at that moment. Like I was like, God winked at us. He kind of, <laughs> he's, he like reassured us, like everything's going to be okay. And you're on the right path. And that just like, it kind of just changed my relationship again with God. And so like when you say there's like this, this practice and this kind of, you know, it's like the starting and then the continuation of like faith. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that was, that was a moment that really illustrated that for me. Like, did you have moments like that? 100%. You used actually a phrase that I use in my everyday life when I'm helping other young men try to, you know, turn their lives around. I say, uh, you said God wink. I, mm. I, I, I <laughs> hand to God, use that, use that phrase all the time, because to me, one of the greatest parts on that spiritual journey for me, you know, and like I said, God substitute it for good orderly direction, higher power, whatever you want, not yourself, not me. Cause we're both humans and we're fallible. Right. So when you, when you try to notice the God winks, the little coincidences in your life that potentially you wouldn't have noticed before, you just try a little bit harder to notice it. And then when you do notice it, you, you, you start to become more clear, right? You start to be able to notice things more. And when that happens, in conjunction with, you know, me, I believe the word prayer is just talking. Meditation is just listening, right? So if I'm sitting, before I come on, before I come on, the sh on shows, before I do episodes, before I go and get in the car, you know, I'm just constantly a couple words here and there. And then if something does happen or something I have asked for, you know, it goes my way. Like you were saying, how you asked for some stuff and the, the people made you a prayer that they can be called upon. And then you start, you noticed when it happened, right? And it mm -hmm. starts to elevate your spiritual conditioning a little bit. And the more, and I'm, that's what I'm obsessed with is trying to elevate the spiritual conditioning. You know, 
And for people who are like, what are you talking about? It's just not concerning yourself so much with the materialism of the world. Try to focus on more things that, you know, service, help somebody out, you know, do something like that. That's just a small step in the right direction to advancing your spiritual life. And, I, and, and ultimately, I believe that the most people who have been on that journey eventually have some understanding of something greater than themselves sooner than later that benefits yes. them. Yes, I, I totally see that, too. And, you know, like I have this book on on my shelf back here and it's um, have you ever read Viktor Frankl, Man in Search of Meaning? Yep, I actually have it right on my wall. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> so, right there at arm's distance. That, so so that's what he says as well, right? Like there, it's kind of like it's related exactly to what you're saying here. When you said act of service, I, I think it's like there's there's three things that help you find meaning in your life. So it's like acts of service or job or, you know, like doing these things. Um, the second one is relationships, like giving yourself over to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Like your relationships with your spouse, with your children, with your family, with your close Being friends. Being vulnerable. Yeah. And then, and then the other thing, you know, the third thing was finding meaning in suffering. So not being like you are, Oof. you can be a victim, but it doesn't mean you have to have a victim mindset that you have to fall into victimhood. So Correct. yes, there are, you know, there's like this kind of distinction there. Um, and, and to find meaning in your suffering. And of course, he's detailing this as he's, you know, he's working on this thing called logotherapy, that he's developing something, you know, a new psychological school of thought um, that's different than Freud and Adler. It's not about, you know, like your fantasies about your parents. It's not about power relationships, but it's something called logotherapy, which is the therapy of, of pursuing meaning. And so... Like, do you see that as well as kind of like when you were kind of at your rock bottom, when you were at a low point, like that kind of pursuit of meaning, like rather than just and, and he says in his book, Viktor Frankl, I think that in America, we shouldn't say the pursuit of happiness. It should be the pursuit of meaning and happiness will come. I love it. I, I love <laughs> it. I'm oh, there we go from from your mouth to God's ears. <laughs> Yes, no, happiness and purpose, all, happiness, purpose, and meaning, all three are smashed together. Like I said at the beginning, you have all these distractions now in society that are trying to pull you away from the things that do ultimately, like the easiest way for somebody to achieve happiness might be, my father wrote a whole book on it called Happiness is a Serious Problem, is the purpose that, of your responsibilities in your life. So for, for parents, raising the kid, like, yes, tremendously tough, tremendously hard to do in certain arenas. It's going to make you want to slam your head against the wall. But at the end of the day, like if you're able to like, like who doesn't like take pride in what their kid does? Like it's, it's their, it's your purpose. Like, I feel like I was, I, I, my purpose is to be a father at some point, which is why my wife and I are sooner than later going to be pursuing that. And that, that is going to be, it's going to give me, a, I'm going to be washed over with a sense of purpose, you know, not to take away, you know, people can have multiple senses of purpose though. I mean, Meaning, purpose, happiness. People who, like, look at some of the most unhappy people. They claim on TikTok that they're happy. I challenge that hard. But the people who are like, oh, yeah, I wake up. I woke up at noon today. I baked some sourdough. Then I went, then I went to the park. Then I slept for three hours. Like, like if really? I, yeah. I, I, I find it very hard to believe that those people are truly happy. They might be happy in a phase. I'm not denying that. But- at the end of the day, does it lead to long-term happiness and the ability to grow? Um, you mentioned, you know, suffering, pain. Uh, rabbi Abraham Tversky, he's a subst substance abuse counselor as well as as well as an Orthodox rabbi. He wrote hmm. a uh, the, the lobster story. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the lobster story. No, but a condensed version of it is is a lobster is a crustacean, right? So it, it, it bulges up against the side of its shell, which is pain. It then has to go underneath a rock molt its shell, which creates even more pain for the lobster to be able to grow. So uncomfortability and pain are the catalyst for growth ultimately. And a society mm -hmm. that tells you that you are the alpha and the omega of the universe and that you could be ultimately happy and have purpose through activism, climatism, wokeism, whatever have you, you're missing the point. You're never going to be able to grow if you're permanently content. And, 
you know, there's also something in there that I was thinking of when you're talking about the people who are told the, these opposite messages that like they'll be happy just through activism and through like, you know, not really seeking meaning, but just kind of pursuing momentary pleasure. Mm -hmm. I think that it's actually a kind of like almost a suicidal impulse of society because like what's happening from that what literally is happening is that birth rates are declining like crazy, you know? And and mm. I, when I was young, okay, I'm a, a late millennial. So it was like, you grew up, it was like girl power, Spice Girls, whatever. I don't know what wave of feminism that was. But that was the kind of ideas that I, that I heard, you know, I heard from my mom. I heard, you know, kind of, it was in the culture. It was in everything. And so I kind of thought like, you know, the messages are like, oh, you don't you don't need a man to be happy or like you don't need this to be happy. You don't need you, wait, like pursue your career, wait to have children, all of these things. Like at a certain point, I had the same kind of rock bottom as you because I was like, I'm basically I've kind of swallowed up all these lies. I now believe that like, you know, the problem is everywhere outside of me. It's with men. It's with, you know, but it's actually with me. Like I'm I'm the common denominator here. Like I need to to get my shit together. I had to work on myself. I need to like just clean out all the crap and I need to like try and find the right relationship. It, it's gonna come, but like it's only gonna come when I'm when I'm working on myself and not like pointing my fingers to blame. Like as you said, there's no one left to blame. Right. And so that was kind of like a similar, a similar thing. And so, you know, eventually I did get my shit together. I met my husband. We had a child. And I'm like, my life is so incredible. Like, I love it so much. I have so much meaning. I have so much purpose. But like, I could have continued down the wrong path. And like, what's happening, I think, with a lot of people, I see this with a lot of my peers around me. And listen, if people don't want to have children, there have always been people who don't want to have children. That's fine. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I have friends who don't have children, and they're good with that. But as our, our a, best friends don't have don't have are, are are not planning on having children. They didn't want them from very early age. There's nothing wrong with that. But I mean, there it, is. I'd, I'd love for my kids to be able to play with theirs, but you know that's about it. Yeah, but there but there's also like it's. I believe that there is societal conditioning behind that becoming the norm for people where it was not before, especially with like starting with millennials. Like I think that that has been the first generation who really like had that idea that like, you know, as a normal idea that like, you just don't need to have kids, but like, and not just that, you don't need to have permanent relationships. You don't need to, you know, like focus on the things that have like traditionally made people mm -hmm. survive as a species. And, 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 yeah. and, you know, what do you think about that? Well, I, I, th I think today's, I mean, the way so you said you're an older millennial. I'm, I believe, on the younger end of the millennial spectrum. I'm not sure, but uh, 92, whatever that is. My mind goes to hookup culture, and mm. and what and what that's really done. I mean, an, another to, to, to tie in the example, God size hole in the soul. I mean, a, a sex addiction. I mean, hookup, wanting to. I mean, a lot of a lot of people when they're in pain tend to act out more promiscuously. When I got sober and I put down drugs and alcohol, I'm not gonna lie, I went absolutely ballistic on Tinder. For, for like a six month period because I hadn't worked up. I hadn't started to work a program to benefit my life. I was just living absent my crutches and just substituted it, like that, like Tinder just became the same thing as uh, a, a syringe or a bottle. There was no difference. And I felt empty afterwards. I felt hollow. And that hollow, empty feeling, I believe is what the whole topic of this conversation is about is that God sized whole people feeling empty on the inside, feeling like, they need some light. They need something in their life and they're struggling. They're like trying to get to the surface of a, of a pool while they're drowning. And they're just grabbing at anything. And most of the things, because to use that analogy, there's still things that are sinking in the water. It's not the air that you desperately need. It's things that are like you're, you're pulling yourself a little bit higher. So it's temporarily working, might give you a little bit of purpose here and there, but it's not, it's not permanent. You know, permanence takes work. Permanent takes dedication. And that what I think is, like I said at the beginning too, how people shy away from accountability. They shy away from responsibility. They shy away from, from the, from the desire to not be spontaneous, I guess. Like you just want to just have everything, 
have the ability to not be tied down by anything. We've lost that as society that being tied down by things that are constructive is inherently good. Yes. Yes. And and it's like quite literally the survival of our species. Yeah. And so, you know, um, it's it's like I, I look at it as well. Like, you know, I think about the West in general. And we look like we've seen both of us have similar kind of like comments and perspectives on what we see going on now with like the scapegoating of the Jews, like with what's going on like as a civilization, like things are crumbling. Like I, there was a um a guy named Vil, Wilhelm Röpke who was a dissident uh economics teacher in Nazi Germany who was saying, you know, like we are trampling down the the civilization's flowers right now. What what's happening? What's what's coming? And 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 what is what is starting to be done? And so, like for me, I see these things as like not being unrelated. Like when when society is is taking down, you know, like dismantling all of these, you know, this meaning, this like these kind of traditions, these values. Um, there's like no sense of God, no sense of purpose, no sense of all of these things that like keep us, keep us grounded and keep us, you know, doing pretty well as a civilization. Then we see things start to get really bad and speed up and people get more tribal. As you said, there's more collectivism. There's all of these forces rising. And then everybody turns and says, okay, we're going to scapegoat the one group that we've always scapegoated and relieve our tensions there. And that's when you have a very like dangerous situation uh, that can emerge. So like, I don't think that all of these things are separate from that God-shaped hole. Hmm. Interesting. I, I mean, the scapegoating of the Jews is nothing new. I mean, it's, it's, it's said in, in teachings very, thousands of years ago that every generation, every generation, someone will arise to destroy you, you me, meaning the Jews. And we've seen it every generation. It has not failed. It has not skipped a generation. Well, all we're seeing now is just, we're seeing Islamic terrorists deciding, I mean, the charter of Hamas literally states that they want to annihilate Jews, not the state of Israel, that's included, but that's a distinction that needs to be made when talking about this conflict, is mm -hmm. you have someone in your on your front doorstep that's being allowed by that stretch of land being Gaza to operate within its borders, and now you want to have peace talks when they're they want to kill all the Jews from the river it's, to the sea. It's insane. Um, <laughs> and then the, we in the West support it and on our college campuses allow real, like true anti-Semites like Claudine Gay to get away with what she said and have one of our pinnacle of institutions or what used to be a pinnacle of institution, Harvard, back her. The fact that she even needed to be taken out because of plagiarism is an atrocity. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm. Uh, but you don't you don't think that that's like all kind of related to the same kind of trend like it's like you know the yeah. the rise of the left like there's anti-semitism in there like there's i don't think that it's i don't think that they're i don't think that you can like pull them apart you know like it's it's like no. it's like a decay it's a decay of of values of society of civilization of all of the fruits you know and and yeah. it's just manifesting now yeah i i've i've said this on multiple occasions in my videos Hamas and the left have one thing in common. They hate the Jews. Just one has rockets, the other one doesn't. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's, that's so, so true. But like, you know, even to go further than that, I think that other commonalities that like, you know, and this is a little bit of a tangent in our discussion, but I think it's kind yeah. of interesting to touch <laughs> on. It. No, yeah, no, <laughs> um, it, 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 it's fun to, it's fun to kind of like branch out a little bit from our center here because there, there are some, you know, religious distinctions that are important too. Like we've been talking about the Judeo-Christian tradition, like throughout this podcast, and what you see is like in the story of like, you know, the foundations of Islam was that Muhammad was trying to like convince the, the Jews and the Christians and the pagans that he like he was the messenger of God, but he was a very disturbed person. And so like his image of God was very, very uh, poisoned by his like psychological problems. So, so the, it's kind of like a, a, 
I might like get a fatwa on me for saying this, but it's like kind of like a, a perversion of God in a way. And that and I think that that's really interesting. Like and and I've spoken about this in in other videos and essays uh, on my Substack and I'll continue to do so to like clear up what I'm trying to say, you know, and really expand upon it, but it's that there's like, you know, perversions of God. There's idolization of people who are not gods. Uh there's the loss of God completely and just this abyss. And like what we see is that all of these roads kind of lead to similar outcomes. And that's like a society that like uh, will, you know, people will will kill each other. Uh, people will, you know, mutilate themselves or mutilate others. Uh, people are going to like just fill themselves up with all kinds of, you know, external things to try and make themselves whole again. Like, I think that all of these things are just kind of like culminating now. And like, mm -hmm. it's all, it's all kind of like right in our face. And so do you think that there's like a kind of a hope in the fact that this is all kind of being exposed right now? Or do you think that like, we still have worse things to come before we turn it around? I, I would say it's the exact same thing as step one in the Alcoholics Anonymous 12 step program. We admitted we had a problem uh, and we needed a solution like, or we admitted that there was a problem. You know, we admitted we were alcoholic and, uh, just like, just like today, I have never been a proponent of shutting down speech. I want people as a Jew. I want all of the Klansmen, all of the neo-Nazis, all of, that's why I never called for one of the protests to be shut down on the campuses. I want these people front center. I want them on every news source mm -hmm. broadcast 24 hours a day if possible. So we can see what people are really thinking. What becomes a true detriment is when people are forced underground to talk about these things and then plans start to come up, right? Yeah. The, I, the, the, the revolutionaries here in the United States had to meet in secret and they ultimately were able to break away from the crown. So the last thing I absolutely want is to let anti-Semitic or, or any anti, you know, pro, you know, pro destruction of Israel sentiments, whatever you want to be allowed to fester to a point of, hey, we have a plan in place now. Mm -hmm. That's not what I want. And I mean, America was founded on the principle of free speech. It's the first amendment. It's like top of top of the list. So I want these people out there and you could, you could have your cake and eat it too in that regard. Like you can say what I'm saying and also condemn it. Yes. That's something that the left doesn't like. They're like, we don't like it. So shut up. Yes. Yes. And, okay. What? And so does Islam. <laughs> Islam exactly. is the same, actually. <laughs> I mean, it's it's very. I mean, are you familiar with the um, the 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 term uh, Quranic abrogation? Uh -uh. Essentially, Quranic abrogation is people always want to point to the fact that Muhammad was this very you know benevolent guy, um, but then later in the but then later it's super. So the theory of Quranic abrogation essentially is there's going to be inherent contradictions within the within the Quran, right? Quranic abrogation states that you're supposed to take the word that is. Uh, that is the more recent, right? So the more recent parts of, or towards the end of the Quran, you see Muhammad becoming increasingly militaristic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, uh, somebody who I'm not particularly a huge fan of was somebody who pointed this out to his great credit, uh, uh, Milo Yiannopoulos. Um, not a fan of him particularly, but I thought that was something that stuck out that has resonated to me. And I have used that in videos to explain to people a lot of the, okay, Islam is... Like what other religion says it is, it is like, so in Judaism, it's called a chelol Hashem, which is doing evil in God's name, right? And the most evil thing mm -hmm. you can do in God's name is to kill somebody in God's name. Where, what, what is something that we've been talking about that like preaches this philosophy? Killing people in God's name is a good thing. So that's, I mean, that's, I, there's an inherent yeah. problem there. Yeah, well, that's exactly what it is. It is the kind of perversion or it's like the reversal, the reversal. And, and so I think that that's why, you know, there's also like you've seen through history that Islamists will pair with the far left. You know, there's that kind of um, and, and the far left, you know, they have like different priorities, but like there's kind of like this overlap sometimes uh, and, and they can be mutually beneficial to each other. And then like eventually like the left just gets discarded. <laughs> and then they're kind of used as as useful idiots. And I think that we're kind of seeing that now. So like. You know, to come back to like thinking about just just you and the individuals out there who are watching this show, like who, you know, I think people who are watching this show probably like do 
the kinds of things that we're talking about, like pursue meaning um, and and try to like have their lives in order uh, in order to like have good lives and be happy and do all of this kind of stuff. But for anybody who's watching who who does feel, you know, like they're kind of struggling or they might know people who are struggling, like do you what do you think that those kinds of people can do for themselves to get them out of, of their own kind of um, feelings of despair or, you know, whatever might result from what we could call the God-shaped hole. I think one of the most important things that goes for everybody is you, one, the second you find yourself living, whether it's when it comes to politics, now things, echo chambers, but more a emotional echo chamber. Like if you're only surrounding yourself with people who feel crappy like you, you're never going to get out of it. You're never going to be able to challenge your thought process. Before I read any news of the day from, let's say, more right-wing sources, I immediately, I, I start my day with MSNBC and CNN. That's what I start mm. my day with. I got to start my day there. I got to start my day with things that challenge what my, you know, I guess people will call it a bias, but like, you know, because everybody's got a bias whether they know it or not to some degree. Yeah. But I challenge that every single day before I get into what I'm going to be show planning for. I challenge myself before I, when I look in the mirror every day, I tell myself when I'm brushing my teeth, Aaron, you're an alcoholic. You're an alcoholic. I have to remind myself of that. You have to remind, you have to, it, for, because people make this mistake that when they start elevating their lives, they, they start to refuse to critique themselves because they think that, oh, because I got this, now I don't have to critique because of that. It's like, yes, self-critique is a good thing. Don't let it spiral out of control because then you get self-loathing. Hmm. But you have That's to be able to critique yourself as well as give yourself a pat on the back. Just like too much pat on the back leads to overinflated egos. And I believe like what I like to call the blue haired barista types who work at Starbucks, <laughs> who think that they are the best things since sliced bread because they use pronouns. Um, the same thing is you can't just beat yourself up or else you, you, you get self-loathing. I like that a lot. So you have to kind of look at the mirror, try and see yourself clearly, remind yourself of, you know, your shadow. Uh, and also, you know, just kind of keep moving forward, like looking at things from different angles, trying to kind of keep yourself grounded that way, I guess. Yeah, you have people have to let people. I think a great way to kind of like bookend this whole discussion with the God sized hole is people they 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 don't want to look. They don't want to be in reality anymore, I should say. They don't want to acknowledge the reality of their own personal situation. It's always somebody else's fault. It's because of this. If I just had a man, if I just had a, a wife, if I just had a better job, if my boss would give me a raise, like it's always external. You're not, mm -hmm. and if you're living in the external, if you're living in like, that's it's also, it's also called fantasy. You're living in fantasy. You're never, if you're living in fantasy, you can never help your reality. That's such great advice, you know, and that's good reminders for us all. Like we're all prone to that kind of thing. Sometimes we think like if I just, you know, if this situation changes, like then I'll be there, then I'll have arrived, yep. you mm -hmm. know? So it's kind of like starting with where you are right now. Awesome. You know, this has been so great, Aaron. I really thank you for coming on and people can watch your podcast. They can listen to it as well. Um, you are also on X formerly known as Twitter. Um, is there anywhere else that people can find you and follow your work? So as of right now, the best way I suggest people, thank you for having me on the show, by the way, before all else, when you reached out to me, I was, I was very happy. I know we had some scheduling conflicts, but I'm glad we made this happen. Um, yes, I'm on YouTube, Rumble, and X is where I post my episodes. Monday through Friday, they go up at 7 a.m. Eastern, ranging various topics from addiction to in mostly uh, political and current news, because I do believe 2024 is a tipping point uh, not just for the U.S., but I believe for the, I guess you could say, the uh, the overall barometer of where the world's going to be heading. Um, and so I talk a lot about that. But if you go to x.com at AP underscore unfiltered, there is a, my link is Linktree. So it has all of my different socials right on there. You can find uh, anywhere you prefer to watch from there. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, hope to speak with you again soon. Absolutely, Kate. Thank you so much. Thank you.